Quebec La Belle Provence. And this Laurentian Mountain Resort surrounding the Circuit Mont Tremblant has been hosting the Belgian Olympic rowing team. And the area has never looked more beautiful than today to this excellent crowd of Quebecois who have journeyed here to watch two homegrown heroes battle a tough international field of competitors in the driving championship of Canada. Hello, everyone. I'm Ron Roos, your CTV host for the Players Quebec on the wide world of sports. Players Quebec is being held at the Queen Mont Tremblant. Tragically, this track was shut down for a couple of years. Last year, and one of the more exciting events ever to be held here, it was run once again as the Players Quebec event. And it is a tough course, a stern test for the drivers as they twist their way through the Laurentian mountainside, uphill, downhill, and certainly a rugged test not only for drivers but also for machinery. The track has taken its toll. Tom Pompelli from Virginia bent his mark in an earlier incident, as did Juan Cocheta of the Fred Hobart team. But the man that this huge crowd came to see walked away from this one mark racing car, Gil Villeneuve. Gil had a bit of a prang in the back of the uh, with the queer. Yeah, week. Monday we did uh, some driver testing and uh, getting down the hill up the numbers of corner. Uh, it's a place where we hit around 140 miles an hour. And entering corner number three, uh, I had a front flat tire on the left side, and the corner it was on the right, so uh, you know what it do. It just went straight, and uh, I hit the dirt bank, so it really destroyed the whole car. I was very lucky not to uh, hurt myself in that accident. Well, I think you all recognize Craig Hill, our driver host for the Players' Challenge Series. Craig, you know, a lot of people uh, like to compare things and so on. They have sports cars at home, perhaps even a, a, a car of their own that they consider is a high-performance type vehicle, and they certainly are getting better the ones you get out of the showroom. Certainly is a great difference between what you have at home and, and what you're putting on the top. Oh, Ron, there sure is, I'll tell you. We took a standard high-performance sports car out the other day, along with the Formula Atlantic cars, just to show the people at home just what kind of differences there are between the suspension, the brakes, the handling. And we drove this sports car with the Triumph TR7 just as hard as this car could possibly go. And uh, the, the Formula Atlantic cars, of course, just, just sort of drove away from it. And this is a car that's capable of well over 100 miles an hour in its, in its, in its stock form. And, of course, the Formula Atlantics around this track are averaging over 100 miles an hour, but that is an average speed. And uh, we came up with, I think, some pretty good sequences and some pretty good comparisons of just what a standard car is and what a racing car is. This is what we tried to show you, that there's a, a definite difference between a race car and an ordinary road car. And we're trying to say that we don't want you to drive your car like an ordinary race car. We want you to drive it like a road car. Now, you see, Bobby Rahal just went on by. He's taking a little different line than me. And there goes Marty Law. And they just accelerate from way from me until I'm nailed to the road. And I'm right down on the mat as hard as I can be. And here they come. And they're on the green. And they're now up to racing speed. And I'm trying really hard to hang on to what I got here. See, I have to drive the car an awful lot harder and a lot, lot different line because I can feel it going out from underneath me. And these guys, they just sitting there, just waiting behind me to get by. See, I'm taking up an awful lot of road on them. And here I'm coming down a couple of cogs and hard into the corner. You can hear the tires squealing again. And these guys, they're all over me behind me here, and I'm sure that they're going to come on by any time now. Here they come. And they're one, two, three. There's a big line of them, and they're just going right on by. And I got this thing just about flat out trying to hang on to them. So believe me, when you're sitting at home in your armchair and you're looking at this, you want to know that when you're driving a race car, it's altogether different. Boy, they're going a lot faster than you can possibly get a really super fast road car to go. And here comes Hector Rebecca coming up on me now. There he goes right on by. You see the way those cars go by? And as I said, they're just nicely getting up to racing speed. Sid Damaski, just accelerating away, and here I am, flat out as hard as I can go, and I can't hang on to them. Of course, they've got the advantages of the bigger brakes, and 
Everyone switches over one of the many bumps on the San Jose course, and Brack and the STP Chevron is back in front of Elliot Ford Robinson's Blue Tui. It looks like a long, noisy stake as they head for the carousel at the far end of the circuit. Cruz is set. 
setting up to make a move on Ray Hall's swing orange park. Forbes Robinson screams up on the inside. Ray Hall ducks inside Rue's white number two roll. But Bertle held him off. Bowsler breaks for Namoro all by himself. But after one lap, he's already a second behind the speed rule mark. Ray Hall and Cobb follow the leaders past the pit. It's flat out in fifth gear down the hill, then hard on the brakes and down to third gear. Lap two and already Bill Noob's on his way. Ray Hall's found a way past Bruce for third. Marty Loft is in the pit. Bill New, Bowsler, Ray Hall and Root. Forrest Robinson has got Cobb in the inside. Dave Walker in the Black March holds off Hector Rebecca, and the Wiley Walker chops him off at the corner. Audi Holmes and Tom Gloy are both working their way up to the front after starting in the 13th row. They're taking the inside route. Herman Gigliotta tries to emulate Holmes and Gloy. Bill News margin is an incredible three seconds after only five miles of racing. Bruce bottoms out entering corner one. So does Pompelli. More of that and the suspension could collapse. Ray Hall slides wide. Cobb almost loses it. The car gets so light the slightest push at the steering wheel can lead to disaster. Juan Cortese is in the pit. The Fred Oper team built a new car in the paddock to replace the one he crashed in practice. Someone forgot to tighten the steering wheel. No wonder Juan decided to stop. Hogan's climbed the bank. The marshals scrambled to help him. Fortunately, everyone's all right. That's a dangerous spot. Jackie Ick broke his leg there in 1968, and that's where Bill knew destroyed his car earlier this week. Joe Shepard's ready to plow the back 40. Craig Hill, number 25, has dropped behind Bruce Jensen, number 41. Craig must be having some mechanical problems. Audi Holmes is right at his tail. Bruce is ahead of Ray Hall. The cloud of smoke looks ominous. Before the race, Ron spoke with the tweet about the new Gabriel Rolf that has replaced the Lola he used for the first half of the year. Little Ruth of Sweden is driving a car called a Rolf. Not a familiar name uh, in uh, racing in North America. Little, uh, what about the car? How's it handled? How do you like it? Oh, I really like it. Straight out from the box. The car was passed immediately. Handling super in smooth pads and blue corner. Everything is working just like a race car is supposed to do. Bill Villeneuve's mark is doing what it is supposed to do as well. Deasley building his lead. Lousler, Ruth, Ray Hall, and Forbes Robinson are busy battling for second. There's a spin under the bridge. It's the Lola of Richard Melville from Jamaica. Into corner one, Bill New passes Spinard Silent, Planters Peanut Lola. Hobbs under the bridge in six. 26 Hector Rebecca is seventh ahead of Bill Brack. Brack's crew put in a new engine for the last qualifying session, but air got in the oil lines and the motor's bearings were ruined. He's been forced to use the same engine he ran at Gimli. It must be down on power. Ron Roosh has a report. Defending Canadian champion Bill Brack appears to be having his problems this race. He was expected to be doing much better on this fine circuit here at the circuit. However, he's falling back of the leader, Gil Villeneuve, at this moment. Well, Ron, he's even having trouble staying up with Rebecca's yellow Lola. And some Pelly goes sailing past. Rack struggles on while Gil Villeneuve continues to lead the players for back. We'll be back shortly for more racing action from Mount Tromblaw. But now over to Chris Economaki and the National Drag Racing Championship. This is Johnny Esau back in the Laurentian Mountains for the players for back at the Supreme Mont Tremblant. 
Tom Clouser, number 63, currently holds second. But Jill Villeneuve, in the green number 69, Steve Rubart, is increasing his lead with every lap. Vince Muzzin spins. He does a spinorama to get back on the track. Dave Walker's in the pit. He's motioning to the left front tire. Howdy Holmes looks for an opening inside Bobby Brown's audio box part, but Bobby has other ideas. Villeneuve has a clear track in front of him. His wife, Joanne, left her two children at home this weekend, so she gets a chance to watch the race. Bowser heads a determined ruse for second. Fourth Robinson, number 70, has passed Ray Hall for fourth. The middle blue two goes like a rocket down the straight, as it has much less frontal area and hence less wind resistance. There's a delicate balance between the downforce in the corners and the straight line speed. To get one, you have to sacrifice the other. Marty Loft is spinning. That technique won't score points. Holmes out breaks Brown at Namoro. The Jiffy Food Chevron is finally in front and now 11th after starting 25th. Dave Walker's back on the track with new rubber on the left front corner. Tom Clouser's all by himself now. He outlined his Lola driving philosophy to Ron Roos this morning. Tom Clouser's uh, one of the few people, I think, around that can make a Lola, at least for you Lola, go well and go quickly. Tom, what do you think? Uh, no secret. Uh, I think the main reason is Runaway wheel nut. With form like that, he should be in the Olympics. It's a long stop. The Woods brothers could have had four tires and an engine changed by now. Wink Bancroft is in the pit. His Chevron didn't escape unscathed from the incident with Glory. Jill Villeneuve, number 69, continues to lead the players for back. A discouraged Dave Walker starts a long walk back to the pit. And we'll be back shortly for the conclusion of the players for back. Welcome back to the Circuit Mall Trombone, where Jill Villeneuve, driving his ski rule march, has controlled the Players Quebec Formula Atlantic race from the drop of the green flag. Tom Clouser 
63, still holds second. Number 70, Elliot Forbes Robinson is sitting in third spot in the two-way. Wrong way, Bancroft headed back to the pit. Even the white flag can become an offensive weapon when necessary. Well, I think he got the message, and here's Ron Roof. There's Gil Goodenough just passing it by, Johnny, and we're going to put the watch on him to see how well he is doing now on uh, Tom Close for Palatine, Illinois. He's been at uh, not much as 11 seconds ahead, and he is back to 11 seconds at this moment. But we also have to watch for the third car in this race, number 70. That's Elliot Ford Robinson who won this race last year. He's just beginning to move up on the back. And we still could have a race at least for second place. Of course, you can never know with the key race what will happen as this race continues. There's another race further back in the field, Ron. From family number 34 and Rebecca number 26 are still battling for seven. Bill Brax in nine. He's slowing down and motioning cars pass. Brax out with just a lap and a half left. A fourth straight Canadian championship will be almost impossible now. He'll lose the heir apparent to the throne. And if he wins today, it will take a miracle to prevent him from capturing the player's crown. From that point, who knows? The 24-year-old could well be driving a Formula One car at this year's Canadian Grand Prix. Starter signals one lap to go. Clouser looks safe in second. He's well ahead of Forbes Robinson, number 70. Ray Hall's orange march is on Roos's tail. Roos pulls away. Ray Hall must have missed the shift exiting the first gear hairpin. Bryce Cobb is at a lonely range, but he's a solid six in his mark. Bill moves around Navarro for the last time. And under the checkered flag. Bowser is 8.7 seconds behind. Elliot Forbes Robinson takes third. Bruce holds off Ray Hall to take fourth, followed by Cobb. Tom Kelly and Rebecca. Bill News' record is now an unbelievable three wins and four players start. He has 90 points, 35 more than Klausler, with Bruce in third with 44, one more than Brad. Ron Roosh has worked his way through the happy mob to talk to Quebec's latest hero. Bill, congratulations. That was looking pretty easy. Uh, it wasn't easy to drive it. It looked, uh, no, it wasn't easy to start. Uh, I have to be very careful all the time because the track was getting slippery sometimes and uh, you just don't, so sometimes you get in oil or, or in water and you don't do it. Uh, no problems with the car, you were worried a little bit about tire pressure earlier today. Um, the car, a middle, a middle of the race, the old pressure fell down by about 10 or 15 pounds. So it slowed down a little bit and it came back, so obviously it was all right. So uh, it opened up with what appeared to be about an eight second lead and sat there, got it up to about 11 and then sat back again. Uh, he was just comfortable in that, in that kind of a yeah, that's a good idea. I think after that, take care of the car. Sure. 
Jackson. At stake today for the 20 game drivers is $20,000 in prize money and points toward the driving championship of Canada. The Light of Motorsport Park, 1.6 miles long, a rough, demanding, tough course, very hard to pass on. But in previous years, the man who has mastered this course is the current Canadian driving champion, Bill Brack. Bill, you've dominated this track the past couple of years, lapping the entire field. How do you feel going into today's race? What are you expecting? What has done to your car to perhaps improve its performance? Well, I'm not quite as confident as I have been in the past. We usually had a lot of fun here. Didn't have to work too hard to get on the front row, but I had to work uh, my little butt off yesterday to even stay up in the front. The shields uh, fit me by two tenths of a second, which isn't very much, but it was enough to put him on the pole, and we're in the front row with him. So uh, it's going to be a hard, long day afternoon, I think. What about your car now? What have you done to it? I know you've made a couple changes. We've been working pretty hard on the car since the last race, and uh, we have a couple of little changes there. We have a new pan under the rear wing to uh, direct the air more or less under the wing without uh, uh, creating any turbulence. There's a lot of turbulence around the back of the car, and if you can get rid of some of that, I think it'll uh, make the wing work a little better. So we, as Alston said, he's up the rear of the car quite a bit. So, this is a very bumpy track, and uh, we've seen a lot of wings come loose here as the race progresses on. And, uh, this will, I think, help keep it uh, together, so to speak. Now the first is no stranger to Atlantic Motorsport Park, and of course for all you folks who've been watching TTV's coverage of the Players' Challenge Series, the driver host Craig Hill. Craig, sitting on a Honda motorcycle, and I understand that's going to the top rookie in the series. Yes, uh, Leo, I think it's one of the finer contingency awards that the CASB has put forward for the Rookie of the Year. It's a good bike, and right at the moment we've, it looks like we've got sort of international competition to who's going to take the bike home. We've got Johnny Gerber of Mexico, we've got Gordon Smiley of the United States, and we've got a Canadian right in the top running for it, Marcel Talbot from, from Montreal. And we had a chance to talk to Marcel about his chances to pick up the top rookie award. Well, I drove last year in the Canadian Endurance Series in the Ford Cars Arc. Although, uh, being up for the rookie award feels pretty good, just the same. Quite uh, enthusiastic about the whole thing. You're going into this race with a brand new car. How do you feel about that particular thing? Well, I'm hoping that everything's going to stay together. Of course, a new car, uh, you always expect problems. Uh, we just hope that it will not creep up during this race. Uh, we've set it up, basically, uh, as it came in the box. We've done no modifications whatsoever to it. Uh, it's running fairly good right now, and we just hope it stays together and finishes the race well. We've got play for it. What about the track? Uh, the layout of the track is very good. It's very demanding on both car and driver, and as a surface, I think it would be a very nice track. Hey, Craig, you've been a chance to take a look at the track today, both on the Hunter motorcycle and also on your car. Well, Leo, you know, we said earlier that uh, Atlantic Motorsport Park is a very tight circuit, and there's several reasons why it gets very tight. The, the major reason it gets tight is because most of the corners on this track are what we call closing radiuses. And uh, as a matter of fact, as you go out at the, uh, onto the pit straight, the first corner is what we call an opening radius, and the second corner is followed by another opening radius, but the rest of them are all corners that close up as you come on. What happens is that you get you get people taking three different lines on this race course. For instance, my driving partner takes a, a line very much like this on the outside here, which is called a, a very late apex. And most drivers drive a, a, a normal apex of a corner. As you can see, it's, it's all in about the same spot, but it's the approach to the corner that's quite different. Whereas I'll run in line very much like this. The reason I do this is that the race goes on, you'll find that the outside of the track, because it's very bumpy, gets a lot of rubber and stuff thrown to the outside of the corner. And you'll find that all the cars will start moving in a little sooner as they enter the corner, just so they can stay on a, a surface that's reasonably uh, sort of dry and, and free of oil. But one of the biggest problems we've got in Atlantic Motorsport Park is the fact that the track in the last couple of years has got extremely bumpy. And this is going to cause an awful lot of fatigue, both on the cars and the drivers. So I would say that 30 laps into the race, not only will the cars start to be getting a little shaky, but the people that are driving them are going to be very tired. And I know that their arms are going to be just about ready to fall off after 65 laps around here. Hey, Craig, we're going to be watching you shake it up this afternoon, but what about some of the other drivers we're going to have to keep an eye on? It's still a pretty tight race. Well, it is, Leo. It's a very tight race. The only thing that could make the difference is Gilles Villeneuve, if he wins the thing today, of course, he's wrapped up the challenge series. But Tommy Fosler's right right there, and uh, immediately behind him is my driving mate, Bertle Roos. Of course, Bill Brack is only one point behind Bertle. So uh, there are three guys, uh, if Gilles runs into some trouble today, that could uh, sort of turn the whole thing around, and uh, we'll have to wait till most for it. But uh, it's been a tremendous challenge series all season, and uh, I'm sure that it's, it's uh, to 
today is going to be no exception. And as I said earlier, I'm, I'm pretty sure that driver fatigue and car fatigue will play a big part in who's going to wind up out in front today. Okay, Craig, thanks very much. We'll be talking to you later on. We'll be back for the start of Players Atlantic under questionable skies in just a minute. Okay, we're back at Atlantic Motorsport Park in Cubanaki, Nova Scotia, getting ready for the start of this year's Players Atlantic. He's had at least one problem in the warm-up. Hector Rebecca ran off. They're repairing his car now. He doesn't think he's going to have any great problems. Remember what Craig Hill told us earlier. It's going to be a race of attrition. It looks like driver fatigue and what they call brain fading. Also the cars. Well, they stand up. The weather looks like it's going to hold off. We hope it does. Now for lap-by-lap -lap action, let's go upstairs to Johnny Esau. Thanks, Leo. Gil Villeneuve was fast as qualifier, breaking the track record by over a second. Bill Brack will start right beside him. Bobby Rahal is in third with a swing orange spark. Tom Clausler starts fourth. He had an accident in practice, but the trailer Lola is all set today. Twenty-six cars will start the players' maritime. Canadian Gary Magwood and Tim Kokonas from the United States both crashed in qualifying. They won't race. On the pole for every race this year, by now, Jill Villeneuve must have memorized the Dats and F can pace car's license number. It's a rough ride coming through the hairpin, even for the pace car. In the blue Chewy number 70, Tom Gloy has replaced Elliot Ford Robinson. He qualified six behind Bertel Ruse, Gabriel Rolfe. Kevin Kogan has fixed his number three Shepard after his Sanjavik crash. The car's monocoque tub is now made of heavier gauge aluminum than that used by the factory in England. They're on the straight with only half a lap to the start. With a win, Bill Newt can clinch the player's title, but Brack has won this race for the past two years. Last year, he lapped the entire field in winning the championship for the third time. There are very few places to pass another car at the Atlantic Motorsport Park. Breaking for the hairpin, and at the end of the straight are the only spots where equally matched cars can pass. The pace car is into the pit lane, ready for the start. The two Canadians lead the international field. They've got the green, four abreast, heading for corner one. Bill Nuve almost misses the corner. Tracks holding a tight line as they line up for the hairpin. Ray Hall's orange number nine is third. Klausler, Gloy, Cruz, and Howdy Holmes follow. Through corner four and onto the straight, Bill Newt still in front. Opening a bit of a lead over the STB Chevron, Bill Newt, the Curie Canada March, is running under Quebec colors without sponsorship this weekend. Ray Hall is trying to outbreak Brack at the end of the straight. Brack chops him off. Bowser's white Lola is a solid four. It's a repeat of Gimli and Sanjavi. In front of 10,000 fans, Bill Nubis grabs the lead and is pulling away. His car control is amazing. Coming through the hairpin, he throws the tail out. Then it's on the power, exiting in an oversteering slide. Bill Nubis locks up the left front brake. If that happens very often, the tire will flat spot. That would accentuate the track roughness. His lead is now a second and a half. Brack, Rahal, and Klausler have moved ahead of the rest of the field. Gloy's blue chewy is fifth, followed by Ruse Brawl. The engine cover of Bob Bea's crazy blue march has come unstuck. There are pieces all over the track. No cars are coming, so the Atlantic region marshals have a bit of time to retrieve the fiberglass. Bill News, white number 69 leads, followed by Brack, Ray Hall, Klausler, Lloyd, Ruse, Holmes, and Hector Rebecca's yellow Lola. My 
Mighty lofts into the pitch with a dish and pop. Bill News, the Curie Canada Prepared Car, is handling the bumps on the track very well. He must be taking an incredible pounding behind the wheel. Cruz holds off Howdy Holmes, number 24, Chevron. Number 22, Richard Spinard, is all over Rebecca's Lola. The A's march wobbles and spins. The rear wing's strut is bent. Perhaps the engine cover damaged it when it blew off. Bruce Jensen has climbed to 10. His exotic plant, Shepard, started 14th. Bill News in the lead and pouring it on. 65 laps at Atlantic Motorsport Park is the toughest test of the Players Challenge Series circuit. Before the race, he outlined his driving technique on this rough track. I'm the car around because that's the only way uh, I can go around that corner uh, quick. Uh, it's so bumpy that uh, you cannot drive the car gently like other places. You know, just turn the wheel and suddenly the wheel grabs the ground and the car goes around and you get on the gas again and, and you drift around the corner. It's really, really hard work. I'm sure the car will, will finish the 65 left without any problem. It's really well prepared and I'm sure it won't fall apart. Uh, I hope I will be able to do the same on that stretch. The eighth wing is almost off. Controlling the car must be impossible. Bill News takes early apex at the first corner. He lets the car slide out to line up for the next turn. Smashing the brakes and down three gears, he's through the hairpin. Holmes is pressuring Ruth. He's by. Bertel's engine isn't pulling, coming out of the slow corner. The number 24 Chevron is now fifth, but Holmes has a long way to go to catch Tom Clauser's Lola. Bill News holds his lead. Sliding wide, Rack maintains his second place just two seconds back. The Orange number nine march, driven by Bobby Ray Hall, is third. Tom Clauser is fourth, followed by Howdy Holmes. We'll be back with more of the Players' Maritime in just a moment. Gil Villeneuve's White March continues to lead the Players' Maritime at Atlantic Motorsport, followed by Bill Brack's Red STP Shepherd and Bobby Rahal's Orange March. Chaser runs wide. Price Cobb's red march drops the wheel off. That was close. Uh oh, there's oil on the track. Lapping slower cars is hard work by itself, but number 69, Jill Villeneuve, has to contend with those three trails of oil, too. This might be the break Jill Brack's been waiting for. The oil's come from Sepperoni's march. He's pulled off, but left something for the field to remember him by. As the leaders work to the slower cars, let's get an update from Leo McIsaac in the pit. Johnny at the third beginning of this race, series leader Gio Villeneuve jumps into an early lead over defending champion Bill Brack. And right now, Brack has narrowed that gap. He may choose to sit in that position for a few more laps before making a big move, but it does look like that Chevron is finally beginning to work. They're already passing back markers. So we've got a heck of a race going between these two great drivers. Back to you, Johnny. Coming down the straight, Brack moved to within a second of the white mark. Hey, all slowing down. Another disappointing race. He's only finished twice in eight starts. Lloyd rides inside Klausler. He's spinning. Klausler's through. Holmes takes to the grass, and he makes it pass safely. It looks like Ray Hall's finished for the day. Lloyd's restarted, and the Blue Chewy is underway again. Our driver host, Craig Hill, number 25, demonstrates the early entry cornering technique he mentioned before the race. That's the line to take when the track is covered with oil. Lloyd Calloway's backwards at the hairpin. His rented over Chevron doesn't look damaged. Bryce Cobb spun in front of the pits. That's an embarrassing spot to make a mistake. He'll hear from his crew after the race. 
Tom Gloy's off again. There's lots of action to keep the pit crews entertained. Last year, Bill Frack said driving in Atlantic Motorsport Park is like driving on pavement laid on a plowed field. I don't think he thought anyone would try to do a comparison test. Gloy's left the rock in the middle of the track. BA's car owner, Rick Shea, acts quickly to prevent a serious accident. Kip Mead's roll is stopped in the middle of quarter one. Drivers won't be able to see him until they're almost on top of him. He abandons ship. He can't leave the car there. Where are the marshals when they're needed to help get the 1,000-pound car out of the way? Richard Spinard just misses. Colonel Ruse follows down the inside. Finally, help arrives, but it's almost too late. Back in the pit, Tom Gloy is out of his car and has joined Leo. Well, the track was getting up so oily. Looks like somebody, somebody dropped oil for about four or five laps. The Chewy was working really, really very, very well on the oil. So I started to move up on Tom Cloudler, and then uh, I think we found the source of the oil. Tommy went to go by Bobby just as I went to go by Tom. And I had to expect to avoid all the mess, and it's... Uh, must have flat spot at the rear tires because the next couple of times off was... I had no stick in the rear. The player's paradigm is turning into a race of attrition for everyone except Jill Villeneuve, who continues to lead with his 69 mark. He'll return shortly to Atlantic Motorsport Park for the conclusion of the race. Now let's go to Alabama for the diving championship. This is John Esau at the Players Maritime at Atlantic Motorsport Park near Shubin Eckety, Nova Scotia. Jill Villeneuve, number 69, continues to lead the race. Bill Brack, number one, spun at corner one just a couple of laps ago. He's still second, but a long 10 seconds back. Tom Clausler, number 63, is all by himself in third. The Jiffy Food Chevron, driven by Howdy Holmes, is fourth. <laughs> Clausler's into the pits. He's pointing at the left rear corner. Tom's second in the series standing. He needs the victory in today's race to move closer to the series leader, Jill Villeneuve. This stop has put an end to his title hopes for another year. Tom stomps on him down the pit lane. Before the race, Leo asked him about being the perennial runner-up in players' competition. I am disappointed, really, but... You know, he, he set a standard, definitely. But uh, second place is just, it's getting really old for me, you know. And I, you know, you always like to win, and it is disappointing. But he's a good man, you know. He's a hard guy to beat, really. So, I'm going to get one or two things, but uh, I, I prefer to win. Burton Rose has now moved into fourth place. The car is quick on the straight, but he's still in trouble on the corner. As well as Villeneuve, another young Quebec driver is going very well. Richard Spinard is fifth in only his second Formula Atlantic race with a planter's peanut roll. Villeneuve's closing in on Ruth Rolls, but the leader's driving is getting ragged. Leo's in the pits with the Acuri Canada team manager, Ray Wardell. Ray, a keeping up with Jill, and now Jill managed to pull away. What's happened? Well, I expected the boats to stay together for quite some time. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be some mechanical problems. I suspect they're both in problems, actually. They're both starting to miss shifts, or they're jumping out of gear. You can hear both drivers missing the gears. Uh, I don't know, maybe Brax in more trouble than Chile. But they're definitely going very slowly. Well, no one else would know it. As Bill Loop storms past Klausler, Tom's handling problems haven't improved. He's driving to finish. Bill Brax, Red Shepard has fallen back. There's only a lap and a half left, and he can't catch Bill News. Howdy Holmes, White Shepherd, number 24, is now third, heading for his best finish of the year. Bruce Jensen lines up Plowsler for eighth spot. Tom's left rear wheel is at a strange angle. Craig Hill is ninth. He's at a tough race fighting the Gabriel I.W. Lola over the bump. Jill Villeneuve streaks past Bobby Ray Howell's part for the last time. He's about to make a three straight win. Sixteen seconds back, Brack is second. <laughs> Pat
past the tower, starter John Truman has the checkered flag in his hand. Jill Villeneuve wins the Players' Maritime. It's all smiles in the Akiri Canada pit as the win assures the team of the Canadian Driving Championship for 1976. The current champ, Bill Bragg, flashes past to take runner-up spot. Bertle Roos is off the track at the last corner. That's given forth to Ushar Spinard, who followed Holly Holmes across the finish line. Hector Rebecca is fifth ahead of Price Cobb. Bertle Roos couldn't restart and drops the seven. Leo McIsaac has cornered the race winner, Gilles Villeneuve. Hey, Gilles, congratulations on what's but a pretty tough, physically grueling race. Yeah, it was a very tough race, like you know, the track was a very bumpy, and the last two and a half uh, were extremely hard. <laughs> you had a very tough time keeping ahead of Bill Brackey, who seemed to be closing in on you at one point. Yeah, at one point he was closing in when they dropped the oil, somebody dropped the oil on the track, and it was extremely slippery. So I was taking it easier than, than Bill, because when you're second, it's always easier when you follow or when it's oily. But after that, another 10 lap, it dried it a bit, and I started to pull again on Bill. And I think he, he spun out at one place, so it gave me a 10 second lead, and that was very comfortable by that. <laughs> you must feel pretty good right now. Yeah, extremely good. Players Atlantic Sales Manager Andre Dahu is ready on the presentation stand. Ladies, on behalf of players, I would like to thank each and every one of you for coming here today and supporting the 1976 Players Maritime Race. It is now my pleasure to present the Players Trophy and a check of $5,000 for Nouveau Champion Canadien, the banker, the winner, Bill Deneuve. The, the whole Villeneuve family celebrates on the victory stand. The win gives him 120 points, 53 more than Bill Brack. Tom Klausner eventually finished 13th in the race and is third in points with 58. The only time Bill Lou drinks is after a race victory. The uncrowned champion shares the spoils of victory with the man he dethroned. Good trophy and good luck for the next race. Bill Brack has the final word. I just want to say that uh, Jules didn't win it easily. As far as I was concerned, I was pushing and driving as hard as I could. Very worthy champion. It drove a hell of a season. Congratulations, Jill. The Players Ontario for most board is the final Players Challenge Series race, and you'll see that two weeks today on CTV's Wide World of Sports. Next on CTV's 